So welcome back to uh, the next session. This is an exciting presentation uh, session on actual projects that have been developed in remote indigenous communities. Uh, they are trailblazing. We're going to hear why they, they are trailblazing. And we've got some great representation uh, from different communities to share about these projects. We have Raymond Lamont, uh, Chief Negotiator and Special Projects Land for Seke Dene First Nation. And we also have his uh, colleague, uh, Brigham Miller. So they will be talking about the Seke Dene uh, biomass project. We have Isla Brown from Helsic Nation, and she is a counselor with, uh, with that community. And we have Rosa Brown, uh, energy coordinator with Buntunt Gwich'in government. She is here as well. So welcome four panelists to the stage. Uh, the format for this session is we're basically going to hear 15 minutes. Uh, some have presentations on their projects, whatever they're going to share about them, you know, the, the process, the journey. Uh, we will hear about a biomass project. We will hear about a heat pump story, and we'll, we will hear about a solar PV project in Old Crow. So I think we're going to hand it over to Raymond and Brigham to start us off. So give a round of applause for everybody on this session. Well, good morning. My name is Brigham Miller. I work for the Seke Dene Band. I am the, I work under chief and council. I'm the counselor for the band. I started working with them in 2020. And I'm also the IT tech for the community as well. So we keep track of the internet for the whole community to make sure that it's running. So right now we are dealing with the project of our biomass. It's the, um, So Seke is First Nation with the traditional territory in the north central BC. The main community of the same name is located at the north of the Williston Reservoir and has a population of 250 to 300. We've been living there since uh, 1990, like that's our new um, village that's been set up and I think, I believe we, the power there, we got power there just recently, like in 1990, that's the first um, village, well, second village. We were in an old village about 16 miles further, so, but there was no power there, so. In the 1960s, in Seke Dene, people were forcibly relocated to reserve outside of their territory when the WAC Bennett Dam and Williston Reservoir were created. A long period of social, economic, and cultural decline followed. The Seke people eventually returned to their traditional land despite opposition from Canada and BC, and a new community was later built in, the, in its current location. Seke is a non-integrated community and relies on diesel generated generators operated by BC Hydro to supply power to the community. I think I'm loud enough, but okay. <laughs> More than one million liters of diesel are consumed annually to operate the diesel and, and gen sets and propanes is the main fuel for the heat in pub, public buildings. Sometimes the generator does not work properly we did have issues with it, and um, we just recently built a new generator, I think in 2010 probably. I can't remember, but it was, um, we did have an issue with it where we did not have power for, for months on end during the winters, like in 2003 to 2004, there were some issues with it. Ten years ago, the decision was made to build a biomass power generator system with the goal of displacing diesel. A consultant was hired to advise CK that completely displaying diesel immediately was both technically and financially feasible without affecting the power quality and reliability. 
So I have here Mr. Raymond Lamont. He's our chief negotiator, and he talks on our behalf. And he's our, yeah. I'll introduce him. He's right here. So. And which button do I push? Push this button. To okay. Forward. Good. So uh, this morning, I, d I did hear a. Uh, in one of the sessions, a short conversation about how critical it is that these projects are com community-led. And that was reinforced by Seike's own experience. Um, in it, this project has been in development for 10 years. And during the early stages of the project, Seike hired a technical consultant. And during that period when Seike was relying on that technical consultant, the technical consultant consultant was making all of the decisions about technical solutions, how the needs of the community would be met. The consultant was even making decisions about how the project will be financed. And of course, that, that, that led to major problems. Uh, today, we're in the second iteration of the biomass project. And the consensus now within the community and leadership is that 100% displacement of diesel immediately with a biomass system only is no longer the goal. Uh, we commissioned two independent studies. Both studies showed that the original plan was flawed. It was not technically or financially feasible. And so after incurring substantial costs and squandering a lot of time, um, we, we developed a new plan. The other, the other problem that arose in developing the, the biomass project was Seke is a non-integrated community. Power is supplied to the community by diesel gensets operated by BC Hydro. They own and operate all of the power infrastructure in the community. And what became apparent as the project was unfolding is that there was a major conflict between BC Hydro and the, and the first technical consultant. The relationship became very adversarial. They were working at cross purposes. No effort was made to, to collaborate. So at that, at that stage, chief and council um, performed an intervention. They intervened. They said, no, um, the technical consultant will no longer control the project. Decisions and planning about the project will be made by chief and council uh, in consultation with the community. So a new project management team was installed with clear instructions to collaborate with BC Hydro where possible. We also hired a new a uh, technical consultant based in Vancouver, BBA. BBA has substantial experience in the de development of biomass energy projects. So to date, the collaboration with this change in approach and change in the management team, um, we've achieved major success in collaborating with BC Hydro. Uh, the, the approach that was adopted with BC Hydro was to engage in joint problem solving, work together to advance the project. And there was a very strong commitment by both teams, the Seike Dene team and uh, BC Hydro to ensure that uh, we were not working at cross purposes. We are close to a final investment decision on the project. Uh, there are some issues still to be resolved. We are, uh, we've completed substantial engineering. Um, no agreements have been reached yet with um, the major suppliers. Um, that work is ongoing. Uh, we have achieved an agreement with, and uh, I think it's a very innovative agreement, we've achieved an, uh, uh, an operating protocol agreement with BC Hydro that basically sets out how the two systems, the diesel, the diesel power system and the biomass system will operate together. And there is a commitment by BC Hydro uh, and Seike to ensure that we operate the, the two systems in such a way that we maximize the output from the, from the, from the biomass system. We are also close to a, an energy purchase agreement with BC Hydro. BC Hydro has been very progressive in its approach to the EPA. Uh, the aim of both parties was to negotiate an EPA that wasn't constrained by artificial limits or constraints, but rather uh, the focus has been on negotiating an agreement that will support and enable the project. Barring unforeseen obstacles, we hope to build and commission a 500 kilowatt biomass electricity generation plant that will supply electricity and bioheat to the community by 2023. The main components that we've identified 
our, uh, our Turboden uh, orc system and a CAW biomass fired thermal oil combustor and heater. Um, our information is and our own due diligence has shown that these two systems, the Turboden orc system, Turboden is from Italy, CAW is from Germany, these two systems have been successfully paired in other projects worldwide and they're meeting customer expectations and they're performing as specified. Waste heat from the biomass system will displace propane for heating public buildings and will eventually supply heat to a new residential subdivision. It will also supply heat to new greenhouses that will supply fresh produce to the community year-round. Food security is a major issue for Seke. Moose populations are declining, caribou are threatened. Um, because Seke is a very, ro com very remote community, the cost of transporting food, including fresh produce, to the community is very high. This biomass plant will supply low-cost heat and power to the greenhouses. It will produce projects that, fresh produce that will meet all of the needs of the community. And we've also identified a commercial opportunity. There are industrial camps operating in the general area. We will supply fresh produce to the, uh, to the industrial camps. We're working very closely with CAW in Germany and their Canadian distributor WGL on engineering and design. That will allow us to build and uh, to design and build a biomass system that will meet the specific needs of Seike and its application. So these are not shelf products, they're, going, they're semi customized products that are designed and will be manufactured to meet our specific requirements. This, I won't go through this, but this is a system diagram. Um, basically, it shows the, the flow from uh, fuel receiving, fuel processing to the outputs. Uh, a challenge for the, uh, for the project today, of course, is the cur current uncertainty with global supply chains. We're at a critical stage now in the project where we want to submit firm orders for major components, including the orc system and the, and the combustor. And if we don't do that soon, we're going to be delayed in building and commissioning the bio biomass project. The other huge concern is costs are constantly escalating. And without submitting firm orders, it's very difficult to obtain firm commitments on, on price. Biomass, of course, is key to the success of the project. Quality my, biomass in sufficient quantities. For the Seke Dene project, we're going to rely on three main sources of biomass. Seke is located at the north end of the reservoir. The reservoir contains substantial debris. Debris that... Um, that originated when the, when the uh, reservoir was built. They didn't log large parts of the, uh, of the ground where the reservoir is located, so that debris, again, is in the reservoir. There's also um, new debris every year in the reservoir due to erosion of the banks and trees and other vegetation fall into the reservoir. That's a major source of biomass. In the past, that, that uh, debris was collected and burned. Also, there is substantial biomass from wildfire mitigation projects and also residuals and wood waste from timber harvesting. Seike Denny is one of the major contract loggers in uh, the Mackenzie timber supply area. We have substantial control over wood waste and residuals. Lab testing has shown that the quality of the biomass is very high, uh, thermal value, ash content, moisture, and so on. Um, we are also seeking one or more small forestry tenures, including a fiber supply license to cut uh, to augment existing supplies. But basically, our assessment has shown that the supply of biomass is almost unlimited. Um, we're rec recruiting local people in Seike to be the plant operators. We've developed a two-year training program. We intend to invest very heavily in training, including pre-employment support and preparation and distance learning. The system will be largely automated, but we will have two or three full-time operators and um, to ensure that we can um, diagnose problems uh, in advance before they arise, we're, in, we're negotiating agreements with the major suppliers for remote monitoring and other forms of ongoing support. A challenge for us in negotiating these agreements and then implementing the arrangements on remote monitoring from Italy and from Germany is that there is very limited IT bandwidth in Seike. The system is not always reliable, and that's due to problems with the provider. Um, 
Brigham is, has developed solutions, and, uh, I, and Starlink may be that solution. We're exploring that. But, but reliable and stable, high-speed internet access will be critical for remote monitoring. I just wanted to acknowledge, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge today the, the generous support from NRCAN, the encouragement of NRCAN. They've funded most of the development. I also want to thank BC Hydro for their in-kind contribution. We worked very closely with their engineers, the BBA team and the um, BC Hydro team, and that collaboration enabled us to um, anticipate problems and jointly develop solutions to problems. We're also now exploring solar to augment uh, biomass. We believe that solar and biomass together are a total solution. Thank you. Check, check. Great. Thank you, Raymond and Brigham. We wanted to hear about the project because we know it's been several years in development and this is uh, second iteration, so it's great to hear that it's, that it's still on its way to, uh, to fruition and, and development. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Isla Brown. Uh, she's a tribal counselor with Health Sick Nation and she is going to share uh, her community story and journey on uh, heat pump adoption in their homes. Isla, to you. Slides are coming. Okay, so we're talking about transforming home heating and Heltzik homelands, which is a collaborative effort between the Heltzik Climate Action Team, our local government, the Heltzik Tribal Council, our Heltzik Economic Development Corporation, and EcoTrust. So for those of you that don't know, Bella Bella is an Indian reserve in the central coast of British Columbia. We get about four, over 4,000 millimeters of rain a year and frequently have gusts of wind and experience winds over 100 kilometers an hour. So we, need, we have heating required in our homes eight to nine months of the year. We have about 1,600 people who live in the community, and our power source is hydroelectric. All of this is really important to know for the next few slides. Um, we are not connected to the grid. We're on a microgrid. Uh, yeah, so our homes in Bella Bella, for lots of reasons, are completely energy inefficient. We consume nearly double the amount of energy as homes in BC, as you can see from this mostly due to awful CMHC housing and colonial processes, and we all know why our homes are crap. Um, so I'm not gonna really talk about that. So this, as a result, is almost 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions in our community come from heating. So we're literally burning over a million liters of fuel to heat our homes every single year, which is just ridiculous and completely out of alignment with who we are as, as health-struck people. So we said, what are we going to do about this? And heat pumps. The Really, the biggest thing was it was about bringing our lives, the way that we were living and interacting with the world, back into alignment with health sick values. We produce, burning a million liters of fuel to heat our homes, creating over 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions from this source, didn't sit well with our responsibility to take care of the land for future generations. So we needed a solution. And one home switching from oil or fuel or diesel to um, a heat pump eliminates five tons of greenhouse gas emissions every single year. And it reduces the cost of heating by $2,500 per year. And in a community where the average income is $21,000 in a year, this is massive. This is over 10% of the average income in our community and has vastly improved the lives of the people who live in this, these homes. So how did we do it? Partnerships. The, 
one of the things that I can say is this project has not been all super easy. It's, we've been working on this since 2018, um, and there's been a lot of phases, and Ecotrust has been our partner through this entire process. And for anyone wanting to like move forward a project, find yourself a partner who is really good at making money, and then teach them how to be a better partner to you. So in the beginning, <laughs> there was a lot of um, growth that needed to happen between Ecotrust and us. Like, counselors are some of the busiest people in our community, and you cannot be calling me six times a day to ask me about BC Hydro reimbursement applications. Hire someone for that. This is something, and this is what we did. We said, we absolutely need to build capacity in our community. So we had local people installing, learning how to, with, along with coastal heat pumps, learning how to maintain these systems, and also learning you know, all of the things that could go wrong and, and easy fixes. Because we're a fly-in or boat-in community, the, and it, it's really expensive to fly in and out of our community, flying in a, a trained technician for heat pumps is really just not realistic. We said we need to be able to fix these things ourselves. We're not importing any alien technology into our community that we can't fix. So if you're going to work with us when we put out the call for uh, what is it? Call for proposals to like companies. We said you're going to train our people, or you don't get this contract. I highly encourage any Indigenous community, when you're looking at a project, that the very first thing is you look at it as a capacity development project first. And secondly, we're going to get some heat pumps installed and it's going to be great. So we received funding from a lot of different places and that's where our amazing partners, Ecotrust, came in. They helped us with proposals and writing and, and really working on having people on the ground, boots on the ground. And so our first phase, we did 20 heat pumps. <laughs> and it was great. We had amazing results and people's, because these have HEPA air filters in them, the air quality in the homes went up. We had kids who weren't having as many asthma attacks. And we showed that these heat pumps work in our community. Because listen, if you've been burning wood your entire life, you. You know, a heat pump, it kind of a hard sell. So that first part was about convincing people that heat pumps work in our community and that it's really feasible and that it has benefits. So we could show that not only the reduction in greenhouse gases, but the savings to the families and, and the improvement in the air quality in their home. And then we like sought more funding and did 50 homes and then another 60 homes. So we have a total right now of 130 homes in our community that have heat pumps, which is around 37%. The rest of BC is about 10%. So we're, we're like th over three times the amount of the province. And, oh, okay, so this is, um, another trick for you, if you want um, to keep getting money, like start small, do what you can with what you have, and then make a video about it. <laughs> oh. I don't know. Oh, yeah, no. I don't know how to make this play. I don't know if there's someone who can help me. And this one isn't even the right video. This is our second video. So just keep making videos and people will just keep wanting to give you money. Uh, this is, I, I'm dead serious. Like make a video, make it popular and like people will, funders will wanna work with you. And so also make it less than two minutes. Nobody's watching anything over two minutes these days. Drinking water before bed burns 46 <laughs> pounds in two. <laughs> Yeah, let's skip that ad. Two and a half. It was 
a battle between paying the hydro bill and feeding the family. And we came upon heat pumps as the best option going forward. I went to phone BC Hydro and it said we had a dollar eighty credit. I swear I could have got up and done a jig because that's never happened to me before. For the kids, since we've gotten this new heat pump, yeah, the cough is gone. Their um, runny nose is gone. The benefits aren't just financial. We're bringing in less fuel by barge, supporting our traditional values, and bringing clean energy into our homes. So for this, for that first 20 uh, homes, I was like the person who was running around filling out applications. We also taught BC Hydro how to be a better partner to us because like really they wanted us to take pictures and like really prove in this really ridiculous way in order to get the rebates for the, for the homes. And so because normally what happens when you install a heat pump in order to get the rebate, someone from BC Hydro just comes to your house but we live in Bella Bella. And so they're like, you need to take pictures with geotags of all of the things that are removed. And so when we moved on with our project, largely because this video and tracking. So start small, do what you can with whatever tiny funds that you have, and then track the differences, make a video, pitch to more people. Okay, I don't... Uh, yeah, so now, after, you know, kind of going along, and it took us, we did, we had to, I'll talk about process in a second. So next, we've secured $5 million for, to have 95% of homes in Bella Bella convert to heat pumps, and the rest will be heated by wood, which means 60% of our community's greenhouse gas emissions are gone. Six, a reduction of um, over a million liters in fossil fuels are gone. And this brings us one tiny step closer into alignment with reclaiming ourselves. This is decolonization work. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think I just have like a couple more seconds. So, uh, I'm not going to show you that last video, but we made another video. Go and watch that video on YouTube. Uh, and I just want to say, it, it's a process. We're a tiny community. Everyone is super busy. If, if you know communities, you know, I heard a lot about capacity building. I'm like, we got lots of capacity. We just don't got enough people. Like most people in our community have like three, four, five, six, seven roles, including important roles like mother and grandmother. And so we, uh, what we needed to do to keep this, this project kind of plodding along is find a good partner that knows how to get money, teach them how to be a better partner to you, track the changes, you know, convince people to give you more money, and then really we struck a working group that meets every week. So people from the housing department, people from the health and climate action team, people from the, the council, just meet about heat pumps and what's going on with heat pumps once a week. We also hired uh, our local person to kind of be in charge of the project because what happens is we, in our community, we have so many projects, sometimes things just stall when too many people are involved. So if you have a lot of different departments like your housing department and your governance and economic development and your climate action like we do, 
make sure that you're having that central meeting point at least once a week so that you can keep things going along. So this wasn't just like snap, we got what we wanted. Uh, it's taken us time, but for us, being able to move and get rid of that 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions has been phenomenal and has really like created a lot of energy in our community around this, this issue because we know that emitting greenhouse gases into the environment isn't who we are as Celtic people. And we know that the gifts of the creator, you know, wind, water, solar, have always fueled and allowed us to live in our place. And so that's what it's all about for us, is, is coming back into alignment, using the gifts of the creator to allow us to, to live in healthy, comfortable homes. Awesome. Thank you, Isla. And you're going to hear a lot more about Helsic's journey, uh, the Climate Action Team. They're going to be up on stage again tomorrow, uh, I think in the morning. So Isla and her teammates will, will be up, her community members, to, to hear about this full journey. Uh, the heat pump story is an amazing accomplishment uh, leading in Canada. You know, the amount of diesel furnaces that were, I think, decommissioned and taken out of the communities. You know, gone, relying on heat pumps, relying on hydro from Ocean Falls. Uh, what I hear about the, the health and the no more uh, health or less health problems in asthma, it's, a, it's an amazing story. So congratulations on, on all your efforts. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Rosa Brown. Uh, Rosa is Energy Coordinator at Buntan Gwich'in First Nation. Uh, you heard uh, Chief Dana Tizatram speak this morning about uh, the work that he is doing with his communities, and Rosa is going to share about the Old Crow Solar Project uh, that has been operating for a little over a year now, I believe. So, Rosa. Thanks, good morning, everybody. This presentation was planned um, to be delivered by myself and my director, Erica Tija Tram, but unfortunately, Erica's at home today with a sick toddler. So it's just me, Erica sends her regrets. I know she was really looking forward to being here and connecting with some of you in the room. So I'm here today to talk about uh, the Old Crow Solar Project. Um, probably most of you know this already, but Old Crow is uh, the most northerly community in the Yukon. It's located above the Arctic Circle. It's part of the Gwich'in Nation that spreads from Alaska through the Yukon and into the NWT. Communities, about 400, 240 people or so, relies heavily on a subsistence harvest of the porcupine caribou herd and returning salmon populations, um, and is a self-governing First Nation. Whoopsie, sorry. Uh, probably like everybody in the room, growing concerns of climate change as well as uh, concerns for sustainability and stewardship um, and self-determination uh, were all contributing factors to the First Nation wanting to look into renewable energy as an alternative to diesel for the community. Oh darn, I keep pushing the wrong button. Old Crow is uh, quite removed from the rest of the Yukon's grid. It's a remote, isolated uh, diesel-powered grid like many of the northern communities. You can see from this graph that the majority of the greenhouse gas emissions that are created in Old Crow are from the diesel generators. The diesel that fuels the generators is flown to the community uh, four times a year, average, uh, fuel hauls and stored in the community. Climate change is affecting the reliability of those fuel hauls as much as it's affecting everything else. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> so in 2021, in August, uh, Shrevia was fully commissioned and is now powering the community. Uh, when we have the solar re resource, the, the um, generation is enough to turn the diesel generators off altogether. And with the battery and the solar panels, the community runs 100% on solar power. Uh, in the spring and the fall months, it's a combination of solar and diesel. And through the summer months, we have a lot of solar when the sun is shining. Uh, so 2,160 panels, they're on an east-west orientation to maximize the solar generation in the, in the Arctic, in the wide arc of the 
summer sun. And with this solar array, um, the, uh, yeah, aiming to reduce um, the diesel generation by almost a quarter and to significantly reduce the amount of diesel fuel that's used each year to power the community. Building a solar project in Old Crow came with some opportunities right from the beginning. All that summer sun was something definitely to be tapped into. The community wanted this project um, right from the beginning. And another advantage that we were dealing with was just the high cost of generating with diesel to begin with made it a great opportunity to form a, a strong business case for a renewable energy project. And just as we were beginning work on this project, the um, federal funding program started, and that was really advantageous to what we were trying to achieve as well. Um, at the time, in the Yukon, uh, there wasn't actually a formal process for having, uh, for the Vantuk Gwich'in First Nation to become an independent power producer. So this was one of our biggest challenges early on, was negotiating an electricity purchase agreement without actually having the regulatory process in place. But that's okay, that all got worked out. Um, understanding um, the grid stability issues with uh, putting such a high penetration project on a small diesel microgrid was a technical challenge that we needed to overcome, as well as just the challenges that come with building in the Arctic and building in Old Crow, a fly-in remote Arctic community. Like everybody says, they know what they're doing until they actually get out there and see just how short that construction season is and just how hard it is to get materials to Old Crow. We needed a lot of technical support. Uh, it's a small community. There's no way we could have done it with the um, capacity that we had. And uh, our engineering team and others played a really big part in bringing this project to success. Uh, here in this picture, we see Dr. Michael Ross, who probably most of you know, who led our grid impact study, which was a uh, really important early stage of the project and was crucial to developing a trusting relationship with the utility, allowing us to build a project that was so large that we could actually turn off the utility's uh, generators. Um, we also work uh, closely with uh, Alex Vigneault, Beyond Consulting, who's in the room somewhere, and I hope you all get a chance to meet him. He's been a close support for all of the energy work we've been doing with Old Crow for a few years now, and uh, BBA is the engineering group that we work with. I didn't have a picture of Alex, so I put this little graph up. It's a work of art that the sort of thing that Alex brings to our work in Old Crow, this little graph just shows the difference of having a solar facing array, ver or sorry, south facing array versus east west facing array, and how it just spreads that energy production over the day and better meets the load. Yeah, so the Old Crow Solar Project won a uh, Canadian Consulting Engineering Award of Excellence uh, in 2019 and an award of merit from the International Federation of Consulting Engineers in 2021. So congratulations to BBA and Beyond Consulting for the, with their work on that. From quite early on, the community wanted this to be a community-owned project, and we couldn't have done it without the financial support that was provided largely by the federal government and also by the Yukon government. Having the financial support to go it on our own and not rely the input of uh, a developer or a, a co-ownership model means that the benefits of the project stay solely within Old Crow and within the Yukon. So the revenue that's generated from selling electricity um, stays with the Vantuk Gwich'in First Nation and uh, allows the Vantuk Gwich'in First Nation to decide how they want to spend it in the community. So we're coming up to our, the end of our first year of operation, not our first full year. We started putting electricity on the grid last April. Uh, at that time, we didn't have the battery of the microgrid controller installed, so the amount of electricity that was going on the grid was curtailed, but it was still powering the community. And then in August, as I said, um, the battery and the microgrid controller were fully online and we were able to um, be fully commissioned. As we look back over our first year and where we are today compared to where we started, 
there are definitely some successes um, to applaud. One is the operating committee that was formed under our electricity purchase agreement. And the operating committee is sort of an oversight body that uh, is represented by the Wintagwichin First Nation and ATCO, the utility in Old Crow. The idea is just to uh, monitor the use of the solar asset and largely just to talk as partners about how the project is, is going. And this has been a really successful relationship. We meet on a monthly basis. We talk about everything under the sun um, with regards to power for Old Crow. And it's, uh, I think, a very informative two-way discussion for both parties. And I think it also really demonstrates the success of that partnership. When we went into our first discussions with ATCO for an electricity purchase agreement for the Old Crow Solar Project, we invited ATCO to the table, went into the room not necessarily feeling we had an ally, feeling there would be some resistance to this innovative and ambitious idea. And we spent a lot of time sitting at that table discussing the project and were able to come to a place where we are today of having a fully commissioned project. Largely, as I said earlier, was helped by the work of Dr. Michael Ross and the grid impact study, but also the trusting relationships that were formed in the room over those years. And now we, feel very uh, comfortable and confident with the team we have. And I often think, I wonder how it would have been if we had walked into that first meeting feeling the same trusting relationship and feeling we were moving in the same direction. But that's okay, we're there today. We have a local operator who's been um, working with us over the past while looking after the solar project on, on the ground in Old Crow. We've also got a wind met tower standing, so that's actually what takes up most of his time. But we're beginning to see the fruits of our labor, so to speak. There's power being sold, there's people being hired. Um, it does create a lot of more work though in some ways. We overcame the technical hurdle and financial hurdle of building the project and now we've got a lot more work ahead um, as we build up the capacity in the community. I like the comment that was made earlier. I really wish that we had started as a capacity project and then installed a few solar panels. Um, but we'll get there too. In March, we partnered with Yukon University and held a community energy systems course in Old Crow as the first step in what I hope will be a multi-year capacity building pro project um, so that we can bring the community along in every step of this project and fully maximize its benefits. Uh, just before I run out of time, um, I made this really simplified timeline of the work that we've done over the past few years just because I wanted to point out a few things. One is, you'll see the 2020 Catalyst program. Um, <laughs> I was in the first cohort of the 2020 Catalyst. Chief Dana Tija Tam Tram was in a later cohort. And I think it's really neat to look out in the room today and see one, two, three, four, five, six of us from that first cohort. Is that right? Daryl, Eileen, Grant, JP, myself, all from that first cohort here in this room. <clears throat> so I think that says a lot for the program. I also want to shout out to the Renewables in Remote Communities Conference. Um, I was there in 2015, came back from that conference, asking the big question, who owns this project and uh, who is going to own this project? And after that uh, was when the community started to take full ownership of the project and sort of took it away from a developer-owned model. Um, so it, it's this room, it's this type of room, it's this type of forum where those ideas are formed. The other great thing that happens in this conference is the face-to-face -face meetings that we have with our funding partners. And, you know, shout out to the Northern Reach program, Stephen Bowman, D Daniel Martin was in that first conference I was at in 2015, and it's, it's those face-to-face -face relationship building um, opportunities that have also allowed us to advance the project. Anyways, I'm out of time, so thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, Rosa. So we have three projects in remote communities. We have a bio heat project delivering both power and heat to Seke Dene. We have a energy efficiency in homes project in Helsinki Nation and a solar PV project in Old Crow. We could probably talk about these three projects in lessons learned and experiences all day, but we have 15 minutes. So if anything that we can do at this conference is just put these uh, projects on your radar, you know, get you understanding that Helsic that has installed 
I think over 100 heat pumps or close to 100 heat pumps in waves and the messages that Isla is, is, is sharing, that's, that's as best as that we can do and, and form these relationships with these four individuals, talk to them during breaks at lunch, you know, after the conference ends at 5.30 today, build those relationships. Um, so thank you for all the stories. Let's, let's go with questions. We were gonna go online for WOVA. I don't think there's any questions there yet. We will we'll hold that space, but we'll just go with questions in the room if anybody has specific questions about uh, any of the projects. Daryl. So thanks everyone, those were great projects. Hi Rosa, I have a question for you. Uh, I think in ACO's presentation yesterday, they talked about how they retained ownership of the battery, and I'm just wondering how that came about and why that came about. Hello. Um, bit of a tough question. Um, in our early conversations with ATCO, that was definitely something that we wanted to discuss, and we felt that community ownership of an energy project meant ownership of the battery and the microgrid controller. And, you know, it sort of seemed like a, an easy grab for ATCO to kind of want to retain ownership of that. The more we thought about it and the more we talked about it, it made more sense for ATCO to own the battery. And the reason is that ATCO is responsible for the distribution of power in Old Crow and the battery is crucial to that piece. So it, you know, it fell more with the responsibilities of a utility than it did with the independent power producer. Another advantage to the utility owning the battery is that over time, the maintenance of the battery is a utility expense and it's not a community expense. So in lots of ways, it was partially also a capacity decision and what the community wanted to take on. And yeah, I'm not struggling with that decision today. I think it was a good one. Okay, thank you, Rosa. Uh, let's go to the multi-purpose room, see if there's any questions there. Victoria, any questions from the room? Oh, yeah, Dave, thanks. One person has a question. Great. So we can't hear that, we can't hear the question. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, I just, this is directed at, at any of the three projects. I'm, I know a couple of them touched on it just briefly, talking about climate change adaptation and resilience as sort of a component of these projects or co-benefit of these projects. Uh, I'm just wondering if that was part of the consideration or, or, or what you've seen from that, looking at in terms of your community independence and resilience. I know, you know one thing was mentioned was about the, the risk of those fuel drops. Uh, because of climate change. Does anybody want to try to, or anybody want to answer that? Kind of co-benefits, climate, climate adaptation. Mike, too? Yeah. I think that for us, it's, yeah, we had an oil spill in our, our waters uh, back in 2016, and it devastated a crucial harvesting ground for us. And so that the Nathan E. Stewart spill really became a massive catalyst for our community to wanting to stop transporting all of our fuel via water to our community. We also know as like a, a land-based community, a community with a very low income threshold, it's very much a subsistence fishing community. Uh, we experience the impacts of, of climate change right now in our community. You'll hear about our, our experience with climate grief tomorrow, but it was a, a major motivating factor for leadership getting behind this, this project, for us wanting to move it forward, to sticking it out, uh, plodding along until we got to this point, because this is, you know, climate change is the challenge of our times, and our core responsibility is to future generations as health sick people and so that they continue to be in their place for as long as, as we have been there. That's great. Rosa, Raymond, Brigham, any comments? Uh, 
I think it's yeah. on. D displacing diesel was obviously a, a critical uh, factor that led to the decision by Seke to explore biomass and solar. Um, his, Seke has a long history of uh, diesel power in the community. Again, um, another presenter may uh, refer to spills. There have been spills in Seke. Um, Seke, Seke has now become, has, is now developing a long-term strategy for climate, resi climate resiliency. Um, this is a community-led initiative. There's a prominent role for the elders in leading that initiative. The youth in the community have been co incorporated into it. So this vision of Seke for greater climate resiliency, uh, doing its part in uh, confronting climate change, uh, Whenever I, whenever I go to the community, there are conversations about that. People tell me that we're preaching to the choir. And um, so I, I think this project for Seike is not only about achieving energy self-reliance and self-sufficiency, it's about doing its part to contribute to a, a global solution to climate change. Yeah, Rosa. I just wanted to add the economics piece as well by being a community-owned project. The Old Crow Solar Project is keeping money in the community and the decision of how that money is spent um, towards further energy projects or climate change projects or climate mitigations is an important part of this as well. Rob McIntosh, question. Thanks, yeah. Um, question, question, Rosa, for Buntut Gwich'in and your experience. Uh, so we're, we support, provide support to the uh, Fort Chippewa and Three Nations Energy Solar Project. Um, so we've watched in great fasc fascination as you did a tremendous job up there. Um, congrats on getting to 24%. What's next? What, what, what we're really interested is 24% uh, um, is incredible uh, as an average over the year, but there's that remaining three quarters that we'd like to still knock out. Have you had some discussions? Have you been thinking through what your next step in um, reducing further diesel from the electricity uh, generation and increasing your renewable supply, what's that looking like? Yeah, thanks for that question. I would have talked on and on about that if the red flag hadn't gone up. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we're looking at wind generation for the winter months. Um, that would be a much larger project. It would um, decrease a much larger piece of the diesel consumption. We have a wind met tower that's standing today and we are collecting that data to build a business case. It's a challenging project and it will be a challenging project for the community because the wind resource overlaps with uh, caribou harvesting areas. So not, a, not an easy decision for the community to make by any stretch and being prepared for that community discussion is the importance of our work today. The other piece that um, I think was mentioned earlier but is never mentioned enough is demand side management. Uh, Old Crow, just like every other northern town, has crappy houses and um, crappy technology. Uh, we are mandated by the community GA resolution to work towards carbon neutrality, working on a community energy plan to do that. And just to Chief Tisha Tram's message earlier today, w we know what needs to be done. We just don't always have the policy tools to make it happen. Even something as simple as recycling in Old Crow, you can look back over decades and see recommendations to have a better recycling garbage management program in the community, but it just never comes to be. It's not because people don't want it, it's because that policy piece isn't really in place. Thanks. Great, thank you. So we're gonna go virtual, we're gonna go online. There's a question on WOVA. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, so I think it's gonna go on the screen. Uh, the best way to read it. Uh, so the question is, what has been the most challenging part in developing your biomass project? So this is to, to Raymond and Brigham. Uh, combined heat and power project, not many in Canada. What's been the most challenging in, in solutions for that? I think the biggest challenge was um, in um, creating conditions, developing a, um, a project management plan that, that enables Seike to make the best decisions in a timely way. And we, we floundered on that in the beginning. We, uh, unfortunately, we, we relied heavily on technical co uh, consultants and um, 
even though, uh, again, in Seike, people are not engineers, uh, they have common sense, they can make good decisions if they're given the proper information. And I think that was, that was the, biggest the biggest hurdle initially, in creating conditions in which we could ensure that decisions in, uh, decision makers in Seike were given the information required to make the best decisions. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a project that was uh, driven by a consultant in the past. Today it's driven by the community and leadership, and they're getting timely and good information that enables them to make the best choices. And so I, th I think that was the biggest challenge, and I, and I think we've overcome that. Great. We're going to go back to the multipurpose room for another question. So uh, my question is uh, for the heat pump project, if uh, developing like energy efficiency in the homes was like an important part of that project, because uh, I would see like the energy analysis, like trying to figure out exactly how many, uh, uh, how much emissions you can reduce, you know, would be part of that. Yeah, so that that is a big part of the project. It's actually a part of our um, retrofitting all of our community homes. You'll hear a lot about that tomorrow. Uh, we did energy audits on the homes before and after we put in. We we did as much as we as we could with you know sweeps and and, and basically um, what we're calling like light uh, renovations to the homes. A lot of the homes need much more than like really an eco fit kit could provide, but we did work with BC Hydro to customize those kits so that, you know, we don't really need, I mean, yeah, LED light bulbs are great, but really we need, like, to work on the building envelopes of the homes, and because, you know, we did struggle with this in the beginning, with, we were putting in mini splits, but they couldn't heat the homes because they were just so inefficient, they were just leaking heat everywhere, and so making sure that the envelope of our home is better and then eventually it's optimizing it to its best is a part of our strategy. We have done it with the homes that have received their um, heat pumps and there's, there's a whole process and plan around that piece too. Great. Some amazing experiences for sure. Thank you all very much. Is there any other, any other questions or any other, any other comments from panelists? We have one question from one. Linda. Yeah, one last one to Isla. Um, can you talk a bit more about the role that EcoTrust played? Did you have a relationship with them beforehand? And it sounds like they created more work at the front end, but then at the back end, they actually relieved the community of some of the process-related tasks. Yeah, so EcoTrust, we've had a, a Heltzik has had a relationship with EcoTrust for a, for a long time on, on multiple projects. Um, and like I said, EcoTrust was our partner from the beginning. Uh, and kind of was really critical to us moving things, keeping moving things along uh, whenever, like I said, people are really busy in our community and especially high capacity people. So when they would like come across a piece of funding, they'd be, they'd be like, let's do this one. And I'm like, okay, great. No, not that one, but this one. And so they really did help us, like I said, access funds. They helped us convince BC Hydro that taking pictures of removed de furnaces was just ridiculous and, and all kinds of things. So they, they were a great partner all the way through and they're still our partner in this project. We're not, we're not done. By the end of this year, year we'll have the 95% uh, of our homes, but they have been critical to the process the whole way through. 95% of your homes are, are heat pump now. Or by the end of this year. By the end of the year. Amazing. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Some amazing experiences and, and sharing of stories. Uh, give a round of applause for everybody.